Our God is on His throne ruling the affairs of men. God does not change. His truths have not changed. He's promised a witness in the church according to the election of grace in all ages that will stand for the old paths, defending His truth. The Primitive Baptist Digital Library is pleased to present the Word of Sovereign Grace. Timely video messages based on the King James Bible and the doctrines taught by Christ and the Apostles. This morning, I hope you all will come prayerful to what we will do with the name of the Lord and to His honor. I'd like to speak to you from, from verses that are, found, that are found in the fourth chapter of Galatians, beginning with the 21st verse this morning. If the Lord will be my helper in such effort. We discover as we read the book of Galatians that the Apostle Paul is writing unto a group of people who had formerly been in the truth. They had adhered to the doctrines of grace and uh, had apparently greatly rejoiced in those doctrines at one time. But now they're beginning to modify uh, their beliefs and modify their worship service. There are a lot of ways in which Christianity appears unto the natural mind to be an inferior religion. Christianity is, after all, a very crude religion in many ways. It's not held in impressive and in large sanctuaries or temples. Now, you may be replying to me mentally, you ought to go to Rome or certain places like that and, and see if you would still conclude that Christianity is not held in large and impressive sanctuaries. But in fact, uh, these places are not a 23rd cousin to what we discover in the New Testament scriptures uh, for Christianity. And uh, the scriptures, New Testament Christianity is very crude, it's very basic, it's very simple. The natural mind might conclude, therefore, that Christianity is inferior to Judaism or other religions of the world which have large and impressive sanctuaries. Christian temples, Christian places of worship do not have a great amount of ornaments, gold and silver, or idols, and these kinds of things, or at least they shouldn't have. And uh, you notice primitive Baptist churches, or at least south ones, don't have pictures of the Lord hanging around or crosses about them, and they don't belong there because God couldn't have been any clearer than he was in Exodus chapter 20 when he said we're not to have any graven image or any likeness of anything of him, of heaven above, earth beneath, or of the water beneath the earth. We don't have these things, and therefore this makes our sanctuaries appear all the more simplistic. We don't have a great deal of ceremony in our worship services. This also adds to its simplicity. And so the people at Galatia are comparing Christian worship with Judaistic worship, and they're finding that Judaism has much gold, it has much silver, it has much ceremony, it has much pomp. It's very impressive in many ways. And so they're starting to mingle Judaism with Christianity. And the combined religion that they're coming up with is, quite frankly, very much akin to the religions of the world today. It's partly grace, but it's kind of a little works mixed in along with it. Partly the doctrine of grace, but partly the old Judaistic doctrine of salvation of the law. It's a combination of the two. And general, generally, this is the way the devils work. Uh, he will not try to sell you something that's altogether bad, but it's good. It may be principally good, but there's a little poison laced in along with it. That's the way uh, the doctrines of the Galatians are. There used to be a little song that I would hear when I was a young child. Mary Poppins sang it. And when a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Well, the devil has been familiar with that principle uh, for a long time. Uh, your television is not all to give a bed. Uh, your television has a few educational programs and other things on it. That's the spoonful of sugar. Mixed in with it, however, is a healthy dose of poison. And I'm afraid it's a dose that's going to do us all in before it's all said and done. Now, the people of Galatia feel that they are undergoing some sort of religious promotion as they integrate these aspects of Judaism into their worship service. Paul writes them this book of Galatians and he tells them this is not a promotion, 
you're stepping down. That the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has had conferred upon it a higher degree of honor and has been given a higher degree of liberty than any religious order of God that has ever been. And so he asked them this question in the 21st verse. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? This is a good question that many people should ask themselves. Have you considered the logical implications of your own religion? Uh, certainly people that advocate a religion claiming that the devil can get anybody anywhere at any time he chooses, but that God can get somebody only if man helps him, has not considered the logical implications of their own religion. Now, have they? And Paul asked these, have you considered what your own beliefs dictate? Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, hear ye not what the law saith. Well, when we go examine the law, we find that the law itself excluded itself as a means to salvation. Because in Ecclesiastes 7.20, we're told that there's not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Now that's in the law. And the law has told me that nobody's going to get to heaven by keeping the law. Job 25, verse 6, Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not, that is relative to the glory of God. Yea, the stars are not pure in thy sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man that is a worm. That's in the law. And certainly that verse tells us that salvation cannot be by keeping the law. It seems as though with the passage of time after Sinai that there was some confusion about what happened there at Sinai, what the significance of all that was. But the people who were there, and most especially Moses, were not confused about what was going on. Moses told the Jewish people late in his life, as he rehearsed the law unto them, he said, I set before you today life and death, blessing and cursing. This covenant which God has established with you, the law covenant, is not a covenant that provides for you an insurance that you will be the most prosperous people in the world, that you will be the most blessed people in the world. No, this is a covenant which could go one way or the other. I set forth before you today life and death, blessing and cursing. And if it's obeyed, then it's life. If it's violated, then it becomes a cursing. And that's what happened, the latter of the two. Cursed is he, Deuteronomy chapter 27, that continueth not in all the things that are written in the books of the law to do them. James says, James 2.10, that if a man keep the whole law and violate in one point, he's guilty of it all. And you say, well, that's unreasonable. Well, Virginia law is the same way. If, if I were to drive through uh, the streets of some large city here in Virginia, and let's suppose I were to stop at 999 stop signs uh, with perfect precision and adherence to the law, and then in that 1,000 stop sign, I run through it. If I start explaining to the police officer that you ought to cut me some slack, sir, because I stopped at 999 of them in a row, he's not going to listen to that. He might write me out two tickets, one for running the stop sign, the other for telling a lie. <laughs> if a man's being tried for murder, we don't give him credit for all the people he didn't kill, now do we? That's ridiculous, right? Amen. Well, <clears throat> Before it's all said and done, we may be giving credit for it, the way our legal system is headed. But uh, sound, rational people do not give him credit for all the people that he hasn't killed. If a man keep the whole law and violate one point, he's guilty of it all. Paul says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, hear ye not what the law saith. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. 
which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now Paul is going to show the inferiority of the law by referring to an allegory in the Old Testament scriptures. You might call it a type or a shadow. As God's providence was bringing about certain events in the Old Testament, God was simultaneously drawing us a picture of something else that was to come. A lot of times I hear people get up and preach on types and shadows. They'll say, well, this represents that or that represents this. And I utterly fail to see the connection. But here we've got a scriptural authority for saying that in the sons of Abraham we have an allegory or type of shadow of two covenants because an inspired scriptural writer has said so. Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondwoman, but the other by a free. And the reason that this statement becomes very important is because that in a slave society, your status as being free or slave was determined by your mother. Uh, if your mother was free, then you would be free. If your father uh, was free, but your mother was a slave, then you would be a slave. Now, Abraham has two sons, but one is by this Hagar, who is a bondwoman. And you'll remember the circumstances that God had promised unto Abraham a son, that in this son all nations of the earth would be blessed, that in this son there would be a great nation raised up unto Abraham. But God is ever so patient, and the years roll on and roll on. This son is not born. Abraham reaches 100 years of age, and Sarah almost as old, and it becomes evident to them, or so they think, that it is impossible now for her to have a son. So we have the first attempt in history to help God in the scheme of redemption. Uh, Abraham is advised by his wife to have a son by her handmaid, Hagar. This is the first attempt ever to help God. It was their thinking that there's no way God can carry through with the promise he's made unto us. And therefore, let's help him out a little bit. And you know what a big mess it's all turned into. As a matter of fact, we're suffering from the consequences of it this, to this day because the son born by the handmaid uh, is the father of the Arab people. And he has been in conflict with the Jewish people ever since. And our world today is on pins and needles knowing what those folks are going to do next. Now we find that later God is true to his promise and Isaac is born. And with the birth of Isaac, Hagar and her son are envious. And in time, Abraham and Sarah have to cast Hagar along with her son from the camp. These two sons are pictures of covenants. Hagar's son, Ishmael, was born under a bondwoman. And because born under, under a bondwoman, he himself is a slave. And that Old Testament covenant was born under a context of bondage. It was born under a bondwoman. And therefore, all those that are born within it are themselves in bondage. In Ishmael, we have one that was born under a free woman. She was born by one that was free, and therefore he himself is free. Then he tells us, moreover, that the first son was born after the flesh. That means he was born after the ordinary process of nature. There was nothing miraculous about the birth of Ishmael. But the second son was born by promise, and that contains uh, more than one implication. First of all, 
God had promised long before he was born that he would be born. He was a promised son. And likewise, the family of the Lord Jesus Christ is a promised family, a God which could not lie, promised before the foundation of the world. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 1. This son, Isaac, was also a son that was born by a miraculous process. It was not the ordinary process of nature. He was brought from a situation where it otherwise seemed that life was absolutely impossible. How can one be brought from the womb of a woman who was well past the years of childbearing? He was brought forth from a miracle. And all of the Lord's people are also brought into this life spiritually by miracle. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ Jesus, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That verse tells me that our belief, hence our spirituality, derives from the very same power which raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. Here's one of the reasons that man, natural man, does just not voluntarily choose to believe on the Lord Jesus. What it takes for him to believe upon the Lord Jesus is well beyond his capacity. As a matter of fact, if you'll really examine yourself, asking this question, are your beliefs voluntary or are they involuntary? I think your answer is going to be that your beliefs are involuntary. You know, there are things that we do that are voluntary. I'm voluntarily moving my arm now. And then there are involuntary responses. My heart is beating. I'm not telling it to, nor am I telling it to stop. Now, what are your beliefs? Are they voluntary or are they involuntary? Do you believe what you choose to believe, or do you believe what your heart compels you to believe? I believe the latter is the case. Amen. Now, have you ever believe something that you recognized as being true. That statement is ridiculous, isn't it? If you recognize something as being true, you automatically believe it, do you not? On the other hand, have you ever refused to believe something that later proved to be true? Yes, I've done that. There were things that were told me that were true, but I didn't believe them. The reason I didn't believe them is because I did not have sufficient light. Now, that's where the issue is. That's, that's where the crux of the whole issue is. Enlightenment. And have been, people have been taught the Lord Jesus, and have they been taught that He's the personal Savior by God Almighty through a revelation in their hearts, then they're going to believe it when they hear it. Amen. And if they haven't been taught that by God the Father, then they're not going to believe it. They will believe what their hearts compel them to believe, and when God's worked upon their hearts, they will be compelled to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me, John chapter 6, verse 44. Our ability to believe is the product of a life-giving, resurrecting, and therefore supernatural power. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. He tells us that we believe according to that same power that raised Christ from the dead. He is not merely saying that we believe in that power, but we believe by virtue of it also. And that becomes even clearer as you move down a few verses where he says, And you had be quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. A resurrecting power was necessary to bring Christ from the tomb because he was dead. That same power was necessary to enable you to believe because you likewise were dead. And you had be quickened, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Those that are born under the spiritual family into this latter covenant, they're children of promise. Their birth was foretold long before they ever existed. They were born by a miraculous process, the regenerating power of the Holy Ghost. 
that first son, son was born of a process of nature. Likewise, the whole system of the law, the system of Arminianism, is a natural system. Natural mind understands Arminianism. It understands salvation by works. That's the way the natural mind thinks. I can show you from the scriptures that the natural mind can understand the law and can understand its obligation to the law. But not so with the spiritual mind. <clears throat> For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and it is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is three, which is the mother of us all. We find another curious parallel between Abraham and our own case with God of the covenants. As we read through the book of Genesis, and we see how that Ishmael is born uh, unto Hagar, where we're not very knowledgeable of what was going on, we might very well conclude for a while that Ishmael was in fact the promised son, that the promises would come upon Ishmael. He was that blessed son through whom all nations of the world would be blessed. But if we were really real close, and with some degree of perception, we know all along that the true beloved of Abraham is Sarah. There's nothing nearer to his heart than her. And if we had watched the promises of God very closely, we might have inferred that no, the beloved son, the son of promise, must come through the beloved woman. Now likewise, when I read the Old Testament scriptures and I'm introduced to that first covenant, if I'm not reading very closely, I might very well conclude that this covenant is God's ordained means of saving people. This is the means of life. But if I read very closely, I found that there is another who is the true beloved of God. It's not that covenant which is epitomized by Jerusalem beneath, that natural physical city, but rather it's that covenant which is characterized by Jerusalem which is above, which is the mother of us all, and which is the true beloved of God. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth into singing thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Quoting there Isaiah chapter 53. That's a peculiar chapter. No, he's quoting Isaiah 54, verse 1. A peculiar chapter because as you read Isaiah 53, the previous chapter, you got the most graphic picture of the crucifixion anywhere in the Old Testament Bible. You got a picture of a man who was being beaten and spit upon a man who is being crucified at the chapter of pain and anguish and tears and blood and death. And then the next chapter opens with this word, sing. It opens with rejoicing. It's like we were saying last night. We deal with a peculiar God, and the Bible's a peculiar book. His ways are unsearchable and past finding out. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, Thou didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. This married wife is the Old Testament covenant. You'll read in Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning at about verse 31 and 32, that God was the wife of old Israel, God the Father was. She was an adulterous wife, though. There was another beloved. That being the Lord Jesus Christ in the covenant that he represented. She, for many centuries, however, appeared to be a barren woman. Not that she had no children, but they were not manifest. And so we read of her, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not prevail over a child, for more are the children of the desolate 
than the children of the married wives, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be <coughs> talking about the great innumerable multitude embraced by the covenant of grace. <coughs> now we, brethren, says Paul, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children for the bondwoman, but the free. Later, the Lord commanded that Ishmael and his mother be cast from the camp. And you say, well, God really mistreated them. No, that's not the case. God promised great blessings upon Hagar and great blessings upon her son Ishmael. What God did not want is for that son to be heir with or together with the other son. They can be blessed apart, you see, but God is not going to bless them together. And that's the point that Paul is trying to make here. The law had its place. The Old Testament covenant was blessed of God when it was used properly, when the law was used lawfully. It has its place, but it's not to be mixed with that other covenant of God. Keep them apart in their proper place and God will bless both. Mix them together and God will bless neither. Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the bondwoman shall not be son of the free woman, or shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And if we be children of the free woman, then we ourselves are free, and does that not make us in the Christian order religion of a higher honor and a higher degree of liberty than anything that has existed prior to us? And therefore, moving back into Judaism, as the Galatians are doing. It's not a promotion, but it's a demotion. They're stepping down. And so the next chapter, first verse, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Look at all the manners in which the Lord Jesus hath granted us liberty. He's granted us liberty for ignorance, and that's not insignificant. If you want to control people, the first thing you've got to start with is by controlling their information. The Lord Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? The truth shall set you free. We were granted liberty from all the ceremony and routine of Old Testament law service. How would you like to have to still be offering hundreds and hundreds of sacrifices and collectively offering millions and millions of sacrifices as they did back in those days. They were delivered from the bondage of holy days and diets and much more. We were delivered from the bondage of sin and condemnation and finally one day because we've been delivered from these things we should be delivered from the bondage of corruption, the thing you're looking at right now. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us, for the earnest expectation of the creature awaiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We've been granted liberty in Christ Jesus. Now let me make but one more point, and then we'll give way to Brother Hunt. There's something else that always comes along with liberty. If you add a little more liberty, then you've got to add a little more responsibility, don't you? Man. Those two go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, in our country today, there is a very distorted concept of what liberty means. In the early days of America, I believe that liberty meant 
the right to be responsible. Today, liberty means freedom from responsibility. Uh, a proper definition of liberty is the right to be responsible, the right to be responsible for where you live, the right to be responsible for the manner in which you make your living, the right to be responsible for the manner in which you're governed. Liberty confers a right of responsibility. Today, people view liberty to be freedom from responsibility. I'm free from the responsibility of working. I'm free from the responsibility for my own conceived child. I'm free from the responsibility of publishing wholesome literature. I can publish trash to the detriment of others if necessary. I'm free from the responsibility of airing television programs which a child could watch without being damaged mentally. You can see today freedom is in nearly every case an exemption from responsibility. That's a sick concept of liberty. Now Paul tells us that with liberty, the next thing that comes is responsibility. Add a dose of liberty, you've got to add another dose of responsibility. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. He's telling you, well, we've done away with the law, and we've added this other, this other, this covenant of liberty, but here, if we'll, if we will contain within this love covenant of liberty, this one item, we'll take care of all the responsibilities that the law ensured. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ who crucified the flesh with the affections of lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. We're children of the free woman. We have been blessed with an honorable God that no people of the world have had before us. Jesus said that there's none born of women greater than John the Baptist. Nevertheless, he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John the Baptist fulfilled his office with a greater degree of integrity than any man that had lived prior to him. But the office which I fill today, though I have not filled it with the same integrity wherewith John fulfilled his, is nonetheless a higher office, Amen. a more honorable office than the one that he held. Any step away from grace is a step down. Amen. Anyway, a step, any, any step away from the simplicity of this service that we have here this morning which the Lord Jesus gave us 2,000 years ago, and there's something that may appear to be more elaborate, is a step down. And it's a step away from the liberty which we've been given. Let's walk responsibly there. And may God richly bless you. This will be my last opportunity, I believe, to stand before you at Danville. I thank you very much for your invitation. I couldn't have been treated better. I hope that I've returned the same hospitality to you. And until we see you again, we hope that the Lord will be with you. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Visit the Primitive Baptist Digital Library for videos, articles, history, hymns, and encouragement www.primitivebaptist.net